All right, welcome back everybody. We're on lab two for multiple orthogonal linear regression. I did some cleanup on my desktop and I accidentally deleted all the backgrounds and stuff for the for the Zoom window, so this looks a little bit different. I'll see if I can get my little TV back some other day. For now, we're gonna press on. So we have readings from chapters four and five for your textbook that covers multiple linear regression. And in this lab, what we're going to do, it's mainly conceptual lab. Um, we talk about regression for the first couple of weeks here uh, so that you recognize its connection to ANOVA that we talk about for the rest of the semester. The connection basically is it's the same stuff. This, the math is the same. Different applications of uh, effectively the same statistical analysis. And we're going to allude to that today. We have three concept sections and two practical sections. Um, in concept one, we're gonna look at how t-tests and simple regression are the same. We're going to expand from t-tests and consider how we could add more levels, more than two levels, how we could increase the number of levels in our independent variable and um, conduct a, what remains a simple linear regression. We've been working up to chapter five, which is an example of multiple orthogonal linear regression. Here we have more than one independent variable and each independent variable has more than two levels. So it's much more complicated than a simple t-test. And our aim is twofold. One, to illustrate uh, this case is a three by three design. So it's a design with more than one independent variable and more than two levels for each of the independent variables. And we're just gonna show how you could extend the concept of simple regression to cover this more complicated kind of design. As we go throughout the rest of the semester, we'll see how this uh, kind of analysis is related to the ANOVAs that we'll learn about later. So let's get into it. We've talked about simple linear regression last semester. That's when you have some data, uh, probably uh, some predictor variable X, and you wanna see how well it predicts some dependent measure Y. Might put your data in a scatter plot, find the best fit line, that line that minimizes the residual error from the dots down to this line. Today we're gonna to talk about multiple regression. We're going to have more than one of these X's. We're gonna have more than one predictor variable. I've represented that over here. I've added another dimension, a Z dimension. And we're gonna talk about how we could uh, extend the best fit line concept to the best fit plane concept. That's where we're headed. Before we begin, we're gonna talk about a review from last semester. And you'll notice I got um, one of these Apple pencils. And so I'm making more graphics than usual. <laughs> Might've got carried away, fair warning. But last semester, we ended up uh, at fairly simple experimental designs. So the most complicated we got was a case with one independent variable and two levels. And we could do a t-test on this kind of thing. Uh, typically, there'd be one dependent variable, something you're measuring, you measure that in both levels, and then we could do a t-test to compare whether there's a difference between this level and that level. All right, by the end of the semester, we also talked about simple regression. Um, there we had a, uh, a dependent variable and a predictor variable, and then we saw if, if one variation in the predictor variable was correlated and explained variation in the dependent variable. Now this picture we're looking at suggests some relationships between these two things. In fact, they're, all, they're just the same thing uh, depending on certain, certain aspects being true. I've got a little green line saying that the t-test equals simple regression. We're gonna show that momentarily, how this can be true if you set up your regression um, in a way to map the t-test, you can make it do the same thing as the t-test. I'm also pointing out here that 
um, from last class, we talked about the shape of data. Over here, I've represented this design in a wide format, going from level one and level two across like this. Over here, if you'll notice, I've really just converted this design to a long format. And so I put the numbers here, one, 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 two, 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 to represent the different levels of this design over here. And so these two things are, they might appear unrelated, but they're, they can be quite related. Now, to connect what we're doing this semester to last semester, effectively what we're going to do for the rest of this semester is consider expansions to the simple cases. We've talked about this as a simple case, an independent variable with two levels. That's a classic experiment. You need to manipulate something. You need to have, um, you need to compare your dependent variable in one condition compared to at least one other condition to see uh, if your manipulation did something. Now you can, have more than one level, or sorry, more than two levels. You need at least two to run an experiment, but you could have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. For example, um, you know, how awake are you as a function of how many coffees you drink? You could drink zero coffees, or one, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six, and that's all the same independent variable um, with multiple levels. So we can increase the number of levels and um, we, it becomes difficult to handle all of, all of these levels with a simple t-test. And so we're gonna move into a different kind of analysis called the analysis of variance. And we'll be doing that not this week, not next week, but the week after that. So this is where we're moving. Now, another way we can make this simple design more complicated is we can increase the number of independent variables. That's the number of manipulations that we had. So here's a simple way of representing the design with one independent variable. This could be one coffee versus two coffees and how awake I am. Well, what if we thought that other things change how awake I am? We could have another independent variable that's not coffee. It could be how much running around I did, uh, this much running around versus this much or even more running around. And we could have another independent variable. That could be, you know, I don't know, uh, how many carrots I ate in the morning, afternoon, and evening. We could have another independent variable. We could keep having more and more manipulations. And we can actually combine them all. We can do uh, we could have like how many carrots I ate in the morning while I was running and drank one coffee and see what that does to being how awake I am. So as we increase the number of independent variables, um, what we're doing here in some sense is moving from simple regression where we only have one predictor variable to multiple regression where we have multiple predictor variables. We'll also see that um, as we increase the number of independent variables, uh, we can run the same thing, this ANOVA, on these more complicated designs. And throughout the course, we will point out many times that uh, if you do it right, uh, there is an alignment between multiple regression and ANOVA. They are the same analysis, or they can be made to be the same analysis. And so that's an overview. Let's start off with concept number one. I want to demonstrate that t-tests are the same as simple regression. So here's how I do it. First of all, we're going to use a tibble. So I load the tibble library and I just make a, some really simple data for a t-test. So we're going to imagine that we've got two groups. I'm going to call them zero and one. We're going to have 10 people in each group and I've just made some random numbers that I'm going to put in there. So here's what the table looks like. We've got group zero, we've got group one, and we've got some measurements in each of those groups. All right, um, so I use ggplot here and I'm making a little graph. So I've got the mean of group zero and I've got the mean of group one. And for fun, I just plotted the individual data points from group zero and from group one 
over top of the bar graphs. I want to point out one thing that I've done here that's new. Um, normally what we would do is we take data frame like this and we, we would use dplyr. We would group by the grouping column and we would summarize and get a new mean for the groups. I'm showing you here that ggplot can calculate the means for you. So we've entered simple design this data frame here into ggplot and it doesn't have the means for group zero or group one, it just has the raw data. However, I've used stat equals summary and function equals mean. So this will automatically calculate the mean for each group and uh, plot them. So it's convenient because uh, and on this line, I calculate the means for the bar, and we get two different means here. And I can just um, add a geom point, and it will display the raw data points over top of that graph. So it's a convenient way to, to show both the mean and the variance in terms of the individual subjects data points. Now, we could do a t-test here. We've got the dv as a function of group. We're setting var dot equal to true for a, just a normal independent sample t-test. And we're going to connect this t-test to the simple design data frame. And we get our t-test. So the mean is 3.7 for group zero and 4.9 for group one. And we've got some a t-test here, t-value and a p-value. Great. So let's do the linear regression. Uh, all I'm going to do is replot the data. And we've learned last semester that using geom smooth and method LM, you can have ggplot automatically apply linear regression to your data. And it's even going to plot that line on there for you. So we don't have any data points between zero and one here because these are categorical groups. But the linear regression nevertheless calculates the best fit line in terms of the, the, the line that minimizes the residuals between each of these data points and the line. Um, notice that the regression line crosses each of these levels at the location where the mean is. If we conduct the linear regression using LM, what we get is a intercept and a coefficient. Notice that, and let's just interpret this. So it's saying that when, this is the Y intercept, right? This is the value on DV that we would expect to have when the value on group is zero. So our first level of group is actually zero. And uh, it's saying that that value is 3.7. Note that is the mean of group zero. All right. Now it's telling us that the line, it goes up, the coefficient here. The formula for the line is it's going up, it's starting at 3.7, but for every one that you go up in the group variable, you go up on the dv variable by 1.2. So we would go over here by one, and we're saying, okay, it's gonna be going up by 1.2. So what's 3.7 plus 1.2? That's 4.9, which is the group mean for group one. The, the mean for level one of the of the grouping variable. All right. If we did a summary of our linear regression, uh, we're going to get a few more things. We're going to see a p-value here. Notice that 0.175 is the same p-value as we got here. Also, we get an f-value, which um, 
happens to be 1.994. That is, if you square root that, um, that's the relationship between f and t. t squared is f. If you square root this, you get 1.412, and that is the t value that we got up here. All right, so this is just a quick demonstration that the independent sample t-test and a simple linear regression um, can be made to be the, the exact same analysis. Let's move on to concept two. Our goal in this lab is to show how we can extend the t-test. Um, or Sorry, we're, what we're doing is we're extending the designs from a, a simple design with one independent variable and two levels that is appropriately con that for which you would use a t-test to analyze. And um, we're, we're heading towards more complicated designs with multiple independent, multiple independent variables and multiple levels. Before we do the complicated thing, let's take one step. We're going to add more levels to a simple design. And we'll point out that is still simple linear regression. Just to back up here, this design has two levels. Let's talk about adding a third one. All right, we can do a t-test between two things. We could do multiple t-tests between this thing and some other thing and this thing and some other thing, but let's think about getting a third level on here. And this will connect to the Slomeka 1960 paper that we all read for this lab. That paper, um, has a was a three by three design. What I'm going to do here is just quickly make that paper, like let's just simplify that a little bit. Um, it's a memory experiment. So you imagine reading this sentence. So here's the sentence. We must postulate that from strictly semantic points of vantage, most confusions in communication revolve about inadequate stipulation of meaning. Now, hold on. That's a weird sentence. What do you think? In five minutes from now, do you think you could recall that entire sentence from memory? How, how well do you think you could do? Let me tell you, this sentence has 20 words in it. So the question is, how many out of 20 can you get correct? Maybe it's zero. Maybe it's 10. Maybe it's all 20. We'll just count how many you can do. We're talking about just your impression. Do you think you'd get them all? Do you think you'd get 15? Who knows? You should try it, see what happens. Now here's the thing. Um, in Slomeka's paper, subjects were given sentences like this. They all had 20 words. They were asked to later remember them. One of the major manipulations was the amount of practice that you got. So what, if you got to read the sentence two times or four times, or eight times, uh, the idea is you'd probably do better. So the more you practice reading the sentence, the more words you will remember. That's the basic idea here. So let's think about this. We've got memory performance. We're going to measure how many of the 20 words you can remember later. That's the number of words recalled. That's our dependent variable. We're going to manipulate how much practice you get on the sentence. You get to read that thing twice. You get to read that thing four times. You get to read that thing eight times. That's our first independent variable. It has three levels. What I've put up here is just a basic prediction. It's just this basic idea. I just drew a yellow line. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know how many words you could remember on average if you read the sentence twice. Maybe it's 15. I just put it down here to represent the idea that's probably going to be fewer words than you could remember if you saw that thing four times. So let's just imagine that the more you practice, the more you remember. So that's the prediction here. If we were, so what I want to do in this section is let's just use R to represent the data in this type of situation. So we're going to make a tibble. We're going to make a practice column. 
re to represent two, four, and eight. I'm gonna imagine there's nine people in this experiment and I'm gonna make up some numbers for how many words people recall in each of the conditions, all right? So let's take a look at a little table that I made. So I'm suggesting that subjects one, two, and three, they got to practice the sentence two times. And I'm gonna say that they remembered five, seven, and eight words, not too many. Now subjects four, five, and six, they got to practice that sentence four times. And I'm gonna say that they remembered more words, eight, 10, and 12. And then these last three people, they got to practice the sentence eight times, and I'm gonna give them 12, 15, and 17. Like that really helped, they really remembered more words. So let's put this into ggplot. And this first part is a lot like what we saw before with only two levels, we now we've added a third level, okay? And we haven't really actually changed the code at all. It automatically adds that third one for you. Uh, we've changed the data frame to recall design. We've changed the X variable to practice and the Y variable to recall, which are the names of the columns here. And uh, there we have it. We've done a, a plot that calculates the means for from our fake data that we just made up. So we've got the mean here for group two calculated the mean of those three numbers. And we're also overlaying the individual data points from each subject, and we're putting on a regression line. Now, there is some small details here I just wanna point out. Previously, the regression line went right through the means of these bars. And it, as you can see, it's not quite so on the button in this graph. There are some wrinkles. It has to do with um, whether or not we treat the practice variable as a continuous variable or as a categorical variable. This is an important decision. For now, I'm just going to point out that it matters. You can tell what R is doing here. We've got a 2.5, a 5.0, a 7.5. Uh, I didn't specify anything about the x-axis and how it should be displayed. Up here, for the practice variable, uh, we just have the numbers 2, 4, and 8. And it just thinks these are numbers. It doesn't think this is a factor. It doesn't treat these as a categorical variable. It just thinks they're regular old numbers. And so it's placing the bars roughly where they would occur on this number line. So we don't see a nice two and a nice four and a nice eight. We'd have to tell it just to, just to show those numbers. It's making assumptions. It thinks this is a continuous variable. Um, and treating that as, an ind as a continuous variable does change the analysis. Uh, here we have a linear regression on that data. I'm gonna say the F value is 25.67, the P value is 0 0.0014. Um, we haven't talked about it in OVA yet, but here's the very same, the very same data conducted with an ANOVA, and we get the same F value and P value, okay? Now, so this is a demonstration that regression and ANOVA are the same here, but what I do next is I convert the practice column to a factor. So now it's no longer represented in R as a continuous vector, a, a continuous numeric vector. It's now treated as a factor, which means it's thinking of the two and the four and the eight as a categorical variable with three different levels. And these are the names of the levels. Notice when I make that change and redo the ggplot, uh, it's not presenting the three bars on a number line. It presents them 
uh, on a categorical line. It orders them appropriately, two, four, eight. But um, this eight isn't way over here because it's just one category away from four. Also notice that when we asked ggplot to show us the regression line, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do that. It doesn't like to put a regression line on top of uh, three levels of a categorical variable. Every once in a while you'll find something like this where uh, the, there was decisions made at one point in time to not automatically do these kinds of things depending on the nature of the variables. You, you could probably find a way to get that line on there. Um, but the final point here is, remember we've converted the practice column to a factor. Now I'm going to redo the linear regression and the ANOVA you can look at these, you can see that the F value here is 11.47, and it's the same one here. So the regression and the ANOVA are again the same. However, because I changed practice from a continuous variable to a categorical variable, the results of the regression are different from before. So before we had uh, 25.6, for the F value, now we have an 11.47. So it's important, this is just a kind of tangent showing you how important it is to um, understand the factor structure of, of your designs. Um, now, to return to the major point, uh, we're working towards a more complicated experiment. In this example, all we did was we took a simple design, let's say with two levels, two and four practice, and we extended it with a third level. So then we've got three levels here, and we're expecting basically that memory performance goes up and up and up across that, those levels, and we made some data frames in R to basically represent this slightly more complicated design than a t-test. Let's move on to concept number three, multiple orthogonal linear regression. Now this sounds complicated, but uh, let's see if the Slameka 1960 example helps us clarify what's going on. So we already talked about if you were to try to remember this sentence, you'd probably remember it better if you practiced it a bunch of times. The more you practice, the more you remember. Okay, so that's one manipulation. What Slameka did, he did two manipulations. He allowed people to, uh, he manipulated how much practice you got, but he also manipulated a second thing. And that is what you did after you practiced. So let's consider this. Let's say you got to practice this zero or two times or four times or eight times. And then afterwards, you, you got to see how well you could remember the sentence. This would be an example of having zero distraction afterwards. You didn't have to do anything except for just try to remember that sentence. Well, what do you think would happen if, after you practiced this for however many times, you then had to practice another sentence? So you had to kind of change gears, and, and then you had to read this one. Communicators can exercise latitude in specifying meaning however they choose, provided that such definitions correspond somewhat closely to customary usage. So this one also has 20 words in it. Now, what, what if, you, if you had to practice this four times or eight times? The question is, would this be distracting to you? Would it, would it hurt your ability to remember words from the original sentence? It's basically the idea here. 
So it's a three by three design that Slomeka does. I've represented the basic idea in this picture. We're measuring how many words out of 20 you can remember from this original sentence. You get practice. You get practice. You can read that sentence two times, four times, or eight times. And every time, or what we think happens is you, you recall more words with more practice. Now there's this second independent variable here. And what I've called this one, <laughs> reading other sentences that will distract you. So after you've practiced the original sentence, you're going to get zero other things to do. That's no distraction. So in the blue line represents probably uh, doing very well. You're, you're still going to be worse if you had two or f two uh, sentences of two trials of practice. Uh, you'll still be better with four, and you'll still be even better with eight. Well, what happens if you have some distraction? So now you have to read that other sentence four times. What we expect to happen is your memory for the first sentence is going to get worse. So the green line is below the blue line. If you had to do that distracting thing eight times, we assume you'll be really distracted and your memory for the first sentence will be even worse. And so what we're showing here is two kinds of effects. First of all, the effect of practice. It's more practice, more recall. And I've got the red line going up. The more you practice, the more you recall. The second one is the effect of distraction. The more distraction, the less recall. The way I've plotted that here is um, this arrow is showing you more distraction, but also less recall, okay? So all these things can be happening at the same time. So it's a three by three design. There's one independent variable called practice with three levels. There's one independent variable that I'll call distraction. It's got three levels. And um, there's, if you cross those, there's nine possible combinations of these things. And I've just put some simple predictions uh, representing more practice, more recall, and more distraction, less recall, how that might add up in, in this situation. Okay, I actually think that this kind of graph is a useful way to present uh, predictions and, and the actual data that you might find from an experiment like this. Uh, when you read the textbook, what you'll see is a graph that looks like this, and we'll make it in a moment in R, but you'll also see something like this because um, the point here is we've, we've extended, I'm just gonna go right back to the overview, uh, Previously, you, you might have think of linear regression in this context as y being the number of words recalled and x being the number of practice trials. So the more practice trials we have, the more words we recall. Well, what if we add on another dimension here, another manipulation? We think that the more you practice, the more you recall, but we think the more you're distracted, the less you'll recall. Uh, when we have one dependent variable and two independent variables, we can plot everything in a three-dimensional geometric space. And that's what I have going on right here. We've got recall, however many words you can recall out of 20, going from zero to 20. We've got how much practice you're doing from two, four, and eight. We've got how much distraction you're getting. And uh, it's not so easy maybe to, to see this as a three-dimensional thing, um, but we're pointing out that the main effect of practice is 
increasing the amount of words you recall overall, and the main effect of distraction is decreasing the amount of words you'd recall. And because we're now in three d dimensions, um, instead of fitting a line, a line just doesn't capture all the ways these dots could vary. And so we, uh, as we add a dimension to our experiment, we have to add a dimension to our line. And that creates a plane. Um, and I've tried to represent this gray area as a two-dimensional line that could uh, go through our dots. And so basically, uh, in multiple orthogonal regression, uh, when you, there's a geometric interpretation of it. When you uh, have multiple independent variables, you um, effectively can find things like a best fit line, but in this case, because there's two independent variables, you can have a best fit two-dimensional line, which is a plane. You could figure out uh, which way to orient this plane is the way that reduces those residual errors. If you had three independent variables, this gets a bit weird because we can't draw another dimension on here. We've got three already, and they're all perpendicular to each other or orthogonal to one another. And just to clarify what orthogonal means, in, in geometry, it, it means that each dimension is 90 degrees to the other dimensions. Um, that means they're independent. For example, I can go up or down on the recall dimension, right? And go nowhere on the practice dimension or the distraction dimension. That's because this uh, recall dimension is independent or orthogonal to the practice and distraction dimensions. Similarly, I can go anywhere on the practice dimension and go nowhere on the recall dimension or the distraction dimension. Finally, I can go anywhere on the distraction dimension and go nowhere on the practice or recall dimension. So these three dimensions are orthogonal to each other in this geometric space. You could imagine an experiment that has, that we're measuring recall. So we've got one dependent variable. We're giving people practice. We're giving people distraction. Hey, we could give people bananas or oranges or whatever we want. And that would be another dimension. It's hard to draw that one on here because visually we're limited to looking at three dimensions. It's hard to figure out a way to draw another line that is 90 degrees to all of these other lines. Um, but if you did do that, then we wouldn't be looking for the best fit plane anymore. We'd be looking for a best fit uh, cube, really, but uh, more generally, we'd be looking for the best fit hyperplane. And you could have five dimensions or six or any number of dimensions, but the basic idea applies. There's some uh, multi-dimensional line that will best fit the data in terms of minimizing the residuals. All right. Um, let's move on to our first practical section. Our goal here is to simulate the Slameka 1960 design. And really what I'm going to do is just show you that the textbook example for this, and you can look at that on, in chapter five, um, is, can be reproduced in R. So I'm going to do this part pretty quick. I, uh, took the numbers from table, right, table 5.2, looks like this. Remember this table here from the textbook. 
and uh, let's put them in to R in a data frame. So I, I do that uh, with this code right here. This is a long format data frame. So it looks like this. We've got number of learning trials. That's our practice variable that we've been talking about. Um, I've been talking about distraction, the number of sentences you had to read after practice. Uh, in Slameka, that's called interpret interpolated learning, or number of interpolated learning trials. Uh, in the textbook example, their levels were 2, 4, and 8. In Slameka, I believe the levels were, so there's 2, 4, and 8 in both, but I believe that that actually was 0, 4, and 8 in the, the actual design. Any case, I went with the numbers from the textbook just to be consistent. And first thing I did was use ggplot to create a graph. This graph is like this one here, figure 5.5. And I also run the multiple regression in R. We get an intercept coefficients for each of the independent variables and some F statistics. That's all I'm going to do for this example. I uh, just wanted to show you that uh, the, just a few lines of code, you can reproduce that whole example from the textbook in R. If you want to go and check that the numbers are the same, you can do that. I've done that check and the numbers that are in the textbook for all the various pieces of that analysis are, are right here too. It's the same things. Now, in some ways, this, this lab is opening the door to some fairly complicated um, higher dimensional geometry applications of multiple regression. We'll talk about multiple regression one more time next week in the next lab, and then we'll be moving away from multiple regression to talk about ANOVA. Um, there's more, there's many more things that we can do with multiple regression and multivariate statistics, and unfortunately we'll have to save those things for a, an advanced course in multivariate statistics. To make a transition here, where we are in the course is really starting to think about moving from simple designs with one independent variable and two levels to more complicated designs with more independent variables and more levels. So we're going to spend a few examples to look at using ggplot2 to plot designs with multiple independent variables and levels. And ggplot2 is really great for this. Uh, here's an example of this plot that we've been working with so far. Uh, if you noticed when we talked about, when I drew this, what I did was had practice on the x-axis and interpolated learning or distraction in this legend here. So the different lines represent those levels. When we look at the ABD example, it goes the other way. So here, number of interpolated learning trials is on the x-axis, and these are different amounts of practice. Now we could s switch that around pretty easily just by controlling what's being put on the x-axis and what's being treated as the group. So if I switch that, we get practice on the x and different groups on uh, for these different lines. Notice that uh, these lines are hard to tell apart. It's not clear which line is for which level of the grouping variable. And in the ABD graph, there are uh, different shapes on the points 
to tell you which one uh, goes for which. And part of your assignment for this week will be to modify this ggplot code into this one here. All right, another thing that's super useful is the facet wrapping ability of ggplot2. Um, let me just say that in this example, this one graph is showing the influence of two independent variables, number of learning trials and number of distractors or interpolated learning trials. Um, we've obviously got two dimensions of variation, this independent variable and this one, and we're plotting it in a 2D space. Sometimes that works well, and sometimes it doesn't work well. I personally think that um, 3D plots are, are hard to <laughs> interpret. Like if we look back at this crazy thing I made, I'm not sure that's very helpful to look at in terms of seeing what the predictions are uh, and what the data is. Sometimes it can be helpful to make things even more separated at a 2D level. So with facet wrapping here, what I've done is, instead of plotting those three lines all in the same graph, I plotted the three lines in different facets. So we have number of learning trials on the x-axis and number of distraction sentences, two, four, or eight, in the different facets. And it's pretty easy to add facet wrapping to your plot. You just add a plus, you add facet underscore wrap, and then you use the tilde sign and the name of the column that you want to create individual facets for. And it automatically does this. This can be really useful, especially to look at individual subject data now, what I did here was I, I redid the data frame for the Slameka design. And I imagined that there was six subjects in the experiment. Now I did that because if we look at this data, I was imagining, and just for the purposes of making a ggplot here with facet wrap, I was imagining that these three data points were from the same person. And these three data points were from the same person. So we had subject one, two, three, four, five, and six. We had six subjects. They each contributed data in this way. And I s changed slightly the uh, repetition function for the numbers one to six. That's controlling the number of subjects. It ends up looking like this. So subject number one uh, is doing two, four, and eight of interpolated learning, and subject number two is doing two, four, and eight, and so on, like I was just saying. Once we have that in place, when we do our facet wrapping, uh, what I've done now is said number of learning trials times subjects and I've set the number of columns to two, so it's gonna make two columns. And what you can see here is that uh, um, on the bottom, we have the number of interpolated learning trials. So that's the number of distracting trials that we had. And this variable is the amount of practice. So you either got to practice the original sentence two times, whoops, two times, four times or eight times. And subject one and two got to practice two times and subject three and four got to practice four times. Subject five and six got to practice six times. So this is a nice way to be able to quickly see what's going on at the individual subject level. All right, that's it for this assignment. Um, we'll be back to talk about the generalization assignment. Sorry, that's it for this lab. Back to talk about the generalization assignment in another video.